Welcome to WMNF 88.5 FM and WMNF.org. You're listening to the Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan. Later on in the show, we're going to look at climate change. I'll also bring on WMNF reporter and anchor McKenna Schuler. So I hope you stay tuned for all of that. My first guest today will talk about the recent special legislative session on homeowners insurance and other state issues. My guest is Orlando Area State Representative Anna Escamani. Welcome back to WMNF's Tuesday Cafe, Representative Escamani. Well, thanks so much for having me, Sean. It's great to be here. I'm really glad you could join us. And we're going to get to some other state issues later in the interview, but I really want to focus first on Florida's new property insurance law. It sailed through both chambers during last week's special session, and it was quickly signed by Governor Ron DeSantis. One component of the law is a $1 billion reinsurance fund. So how would that reinsurance fund work and how, how is it paid for? Well, thanks so much for having me. I mean, part of the opposition to this reform package, with the air quotes for our listeners, is that uh, it does not guarantee any relief to Florida families in the immediate, let alone potentially ever. Um, this really was a, a package designed for the insurance industry, um, not to the best interest of consumers. And not only does it strip away consumer rights to challenge insurance companies when they don't pay out a, a claim, but as you've noted, it's essentially a, a publicly funded bailout for insurance companies. Um, it, it's, it's hard to uh, guarantee that the, the publicly funded reinsurance option, which is essentially you know, what this is, it's, it's money going towards um, uh, an, an, an option for private insurance companies to purchase reinsurance that's publicly funded versus uh, one that is private with the intention that savings acquired through that option will be passed down to consumers. But again, it, there really is no indication that's going to happen. And so though the public is paying for this uh, reinsurance option, um, uh, there was no guarantee in any staff analysis or by any lawmaker that those savings would actually be felt by the consumer. It might be felt by the insurance company and their executives, but not by the consumer. And what they're hoping is that if the insurance companies save money by the, getting this publicly funded reinsurance, eventually they might pass some of that savings down to consumers. Right. I mean, it's, it's trickle down economics, which we know time and time again does not actually work. And it's frustrating because insurance companies have made millions, if not billions, um, in their practice of denying claims. And where I am in Orlando, we have claims from a 2020 tornado that randomly hit our town that still have not been paid out in full. And of course, in all the coastal communities, it's even worse. People are being dropped by their insurance providers. My dad was dropped last year. And, 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 and this package, this reform package, um, really doesn't guarantee a lot of accountability with the insurance industry. In fact, one of the changes it also makes is it, it decreases the amount of time that you, a consumer, have to file a claim while um, also providing a carve out for insurance companies in the case of a hurricane where they can extend their time. And so again, there's just so many changes that are really much designed to benefit the industry versus the consumer. Our guest is Orlando Area State Representative Anna Escamani. You're listening to WMNF Tampa, and this is Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan. Another thing that will benefit the insurance companies in this bill is something called one-way attorney fees are going away. So, um, you know, that if to someone who may have never heard of this before, that sounds great that there's going to be this cost savings of one-way attorney fees. But I heard a lot of people in your caucus talking about how that's bad for consumers. Why is that bad for consumers? It's very bad for consumers. So for those who don't know what a one-way attorney fee is, um, it, it's basically uh, the the ability that if, if you file a large company, in this case, insurance companies, and you win your case, that the insurance company also covers the cost of your attorney fees. And the entire point of this structure is to open up access to the courts for everyday people who might not have the means to hire an attorney. And it was a 1999 uh, Florida State Supreme Court case with State Farm that, that really helped shine a light on why one-way attorney fees exist, which they've been in, in place in Florida for more than 100 years. And in this, in this Supreme Court case, to make a long story short, um, a South Florida woman was hit by a car while walking, and she suffered injuries from that and had to go to the hospital. She filed a claim with the driver's insurance company, State Farm, to cover her medical expenses, and State Farm said no. 
And so she went to court and she was only able to go to court because of one-way attorney fees. And sure enough, State Farm was in the wrong and her medical bills were paid for. And what's important to note about one-way attorney fees is that a lawyer does not take up your case unless they think you can win. So there really is a, a balancing act here because again, if, if, if an attorney does not think that they'll be paid um, by this claim, by this lawsuit, they're not going to pursue it. And the concern from the from the insurance industry is that there's fraud, that one way attorney fees incentivize fraud, incentivizes people to um, have frivolous lawsuits, which I'm not going to deny that there's fraud. There's fraud in every industry, in every situation. But the complete elimination of attorney fees is an extreme response to cases of fraud. And it does strip away access to the courts for everyday people, especially those who are of low wealth. Who at this point, if an insurance company denies their claim, which is very likely, their options to seek any type of uh, justice in a court of law is close to zero. And that's probably one of the most damaging components of this bill of now law is the inability for everyday Floridians who don't have the means to hire an attorney to now be able to go to court. And on that related note of if you think that your insurance company is giving you the runaround and you want to take them to court, there's another aspect of this new law that makes it more difficult or even impossible for some people to. And that's uh, agree. If you agree to take your case to binding arbitration, you'll get a break on your insurance premium. So that sounds fantastic. I want to save money on my insurance premium. I'll just agree to take binding arbitration. Is there a problem with that? Yeah, there's a huge problem with that. I mean, and, and my colleagues who are attorneys really highlighted this on the House floor and in committee because even just the process of binding arbitration is incredibly expensive and complicated. Um, and it can cost anywhere from $5,000, if not more. And so, again, all the reforms in this package were intentionally one sided to support an industry that has made uh, huge profits off the backs of Floridians in denying claims, in, in paying huge bonuses and salaries to their executives and, and their C-suite officers. And meanwhile, Floridians are getting dropped. And so this is another shift that not only forces consumers to go into a, uh, into a, uh, you know, a, an arbitration space where there might not necessarily be in the advantage, but then if you can't afford to hire an attorney to navigate that process, then you're pretty much out of luck. And so it is, it is another example of how one-sided this entire policy proposal is and, and, and now is the law. And it may be the case where you are a Florida homeowner, perhaps you've lived your whole life in Florida and you've had this insurance company this on your home in Florida. And if you agree to binding arbitration, that arbitration might happen in a different state and you have to go there. Absolutely. And we've already seen these situations. Actually, we have attorneys in Florida who are having to learn New York law or Delaware law because that's where the arbitration is going. And so that is such a great point. And again, insurance companies are going to take whatever steps they can uh, to avoid paying you and to lock you out of the courts. And what really concerns me is that this is just one example of property insurance. There is at this point, nothing to stop the Republican party from going after the ability to file claims in the situation of health insurance or auto insurance. I mean, if they were successful in stripping away access to the courts in the case of property insurance, you know, the Florida Chamber and other big business associations are eyeing tort changes in every field. And so it, it really is unsettling. I mean, of course, in the immediate, it's, it's upsetting for homeowners and renters because we're not going to see immediate relief when it comes to property insurance. But in the context of just the macro concerns, this is going to be a trend in every sector that should be alarming for consumers across the state. Our guest is Orlando Area State Representative Anna Escamani, and you're listening to 88.5 FM, WMNF Tampa, St. Petersburg. I'm Sean Canan, and this is the WMNF Tuesday Cafe. Another part of the insurance bill that passed last week and became law when it was signed by Governor DeSantis last week is that it, it takes action to limit the number or reduce the number of customers of citizens' property insurance. So how does this new law do that? 
Well, I'm so glad we're talking about citizens because this was probably one of the most concerning parts of the bill when it comes to direct impact because the elimination of one-way attorney fees, it's not retroactive. So hypothetically, those who are impacted by Hurricanes Ian and Nicole um, should hopefully still be able to uh, uh, pursue a claim. And, and if, if that claim is, un, is unpaid or denied, have the ability to still access the courts. The changes to citizens are, are immediate and essentially will force citizen customers to either have the rate go up by upwards of 20% or get forced into a private insurance plan that is upwards of 20% more expensive. Um, citizen uh, customers are also going to be forced to purchase flood insurance. Um, even if they don't live in an area or maybe they live in a condo where they don't need flood insurance, they'll be forced to purchase flood insurance. And, and the entire goal of this policy of this, of this now law is to depopulate citizens, but at the cost of the consumer. And I, and I think there's a fair argument to be made that you know citizens which is supposed to be the insurer of last resort has become the insurer of only resort. And, and depopulation is, is trying to make the private market have more customers again. But the fact that we're doing that in the legislature by forcing citizen customers to pay more or be kicked off citizens to pay more in a private market, it's sick. And you're forcing Floridians into an unstable market to benefit the for-profit companies. It's it's bad policy, and it's not something we should be doing when the market is incredibly unstable. And I asked the chair, uh, you know, of this committee, the sponsor of this bill, um, you know, what's going to be the immediate result, you know, for uh, our our citizen cons customers and consumers, and and they were so, um, you know, um, uh, avoiding that question because they know that the reality is that you're going to get a renewal notice, and it's going to be either twenty percent higher or push the private sector with a 20% higher. And I, I don't know about you, but I thought the entire point of this special session was to reduce costs, not make things more expensive for Floridians. Our guest is Orlando Area State Representative Ana Escamani, and we're talking about the new law in Florida after last week's special session of the legislature that makes big changes to the property insurance market. One of the things that it does is it forbids assignment of benefits, AOB for property insurance claims. What impact will that have? So AOB is, I think, is an area where Republicans and Democrats definitely have shared concerns because of its potential of fraud. Um, this is the environment where, for example, a storm comes through and you have at your door roofers or other types of um, um, sellers essentially trying to uh, um, solicit your business. And so they'll, they'll come, they'll say, hey, a storm came through here, you know, I, we can help fix your roof. Um, your insurance company will pay for it. If you sign this assignment benefits agreement, which basically says you're gonna allow this third party to negotiate with your insurance company and, um, and get the roof fixed with the insurance company paying for it. But there are situations of fraud where the the contractor works with an attorney and they basically are going to take that insurance company to court and uh, potentially you know, litigate this to the point where um, I, the, uh, the, the, fr the frivolousness of the lawsuit becomes pretty clear where you didn't actually have a claim based on the insurance company contract you have. So you're basically signing away the rights to your contract to a third party to negotiate on your behalf. And there's pros to this too. I mean, if you're not someone who has the time or the knowledge or um, the expertise to negotiate with your insurance company, then you might want to have an AOB and give someone permission to do that on your behalf. But there are cases of fraud that take place in the AOB marketplace. But uh, completely eliminating AOB, again, it's another attempt to make it harder for consumers to seek payment from their insurance company because some consumers might have a trusted individual or a trusted actor to go towards to negotiate on their behalf. Um, and so the complete elimination of it, it, it goes way beyond the issue of fraud because now not only are you eliminating uh, you know, legitimate claims that someone might have through AOB, uh, but you're also just taking away another tool that someone can lean on uh, when they do find themselves in a crisis situation. So 
I think you, I think there, there were good AOB reforms passed previously where we saw a reduction in lawsuits by 30%. Uh, but unfortunately, the complete stripping away of AOBs, it, it does set another precedent that you, the consumer, have less options and less rights uh, to negotiate and challenge your insurance provider. Before we move on from insurance, is there anything else about last week's special session when it comes to insurance that uh, our listeners should know about before we talk about things like toll, uh, toll relief and, and so forth? Well, there was a pretty clear reason why Governor DeSantis wanted this special session to be hosted after the election and why he signed this insurance bill alongside the disaster relief package. Because even Governor DeSantis knows that this is not a popular proposal, that this is a big giveaway to insurance companies, their executives, their shareholders. Um, and so even he knows that th this was not a popular package to pursue. And so I, I think it's important for consumers to speak out, contact your state lawmakers on this, and, and we have to keep fighting for reductions. You know, we have regular session that will start in March. We cannot ignore this issue. And so we have to keep pushing for consumer centric solutions, not industry focused ones. And there were some other, there were some amendments that you and your fellow Democrats were bringing up on the floor of the house, for example, and they kept repeatedly getting shot down by the Republicans. What were some of the solutions that, that you suggested? Well, I, I appreciate that question. I mean, only did we have amendments to try to mitigate the concerns in this bill, but we filed our own prop insurance bill um, House Bill 9A was the Democratic proposal for property insurance reform, and it was ruled out of order special session. So I don't want anyone out there to think that as Democrats, we're just complaining and we're not offering solutions. We literally filed our own proposal to be considered, and it was just shot down without any consideration. And amendments were the same. We filed multiple amendments in committee and on the House floor um, to put caps, temporary caps on premiums. Um, I filed an amendment to prohibit executives from receiving bonuses or salary increases if they increase premiums. That was also voted down by Republicans. And so the reality of a, of a super majority structure is that it's, it's one party control. And it's been like that in Florida for 20 some years now. And it's only going to get worse. Um, and so we're we're continuously pushing for consumer rights and you know putting our proposals out there. But it's incredibly frustrating that even when we do that and want to have legitimate policy debates and conversations, I, I, th those ideas are shot down without even a consideration or thought. Another thing that got passed last week and became law is this break on tolls for people who drive a lot on toll roads. Uh, what are your thoughts on on that? one component. So the special session included three bills in totality. Um, and that is the property insurance bill, this toll relief bill, and alongside um, a, a larger disaster relief tax package. Um, and so this toll relief program, you know, much of this is being paid for by dollars in the American Rescue Plan. You know, Florida has a huge budget surplus thanks to federal support. And so this program is going to cost about half a billion dollars. And basically, starting January 1st through the entire year, any driver that has a transponder, so you have to have a transponder to benefit from this, who has 35 or more paid transactions per month, uh, will basically receive a 50% toll credit at the end of that month. Um, and so for those who don't have transponders but do drive um, this much, really do encourage you to consider getting a transponder because you won't be able to tap into this benefit unless you do. Um, I also add that as Democrats, we try to prohibit any of this public money from being used for advertisement of elected officials. Um, it, very concerned that Governor DeSantis will continue to use public money to just boost his own name. And uh, the Florida Department of Transportation estimated this program but actually cost about $450 million and yet half a billion was allocated. So we are concerned that that additional 50 mil could be used for self-promotion, if you will. Uh, but of course, though we tried that amendment in committee and on the House floor, it was denied both times. And that I found that interesting because of how big of a stink it was the, a couple of years ago when Agriculture Commissioner Nikki Freed put her photo on essentially on a department 
uh, stickers that would go on gas pumps. That was a huge scandal, it seemed. And then the the Republicans this year essentially had the chance to forbid or outlaw it in when it comes to uh, Governor DeSantis getting publicity on the toll roads. But uh, they they just said, no, nah, well, we won't worry about that. It is a constant ideology of convenience where my Republican colleagues will preach one thing and then do something else. Um, as we see with reproductive rights and issues of choice, you know, they want to be pro-choice when it comes to vaccines and mandates, but um, don't want women to have a choice when it comes to our bodily autonomy. And this situation is no different. Um, they don't want Democrats to advertise with public money, but they will totally allow themselves to do that. So we'll continue to you know, hold them accountable to um, these uh, uh, so-called values that they hold, but obviously the irony is palpable and uh, it's incredibly frustrating, um, you know, simply because they can, they operate however they wish to with no foundational uh, direction based upon um, uh, what actions we've seen from them. Our guest is Orlando area state representative Anna Eskamani, a Democrat in the House of Representatives in Tallahassee. And you're listening to WMNF's Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan, and this is 88.5 FM in the St. Petersburg, Clearwater, Tampa, Lakeland, Sarasota area. You mentioned um, choice and abortion rights. Last month, State Senate President Kathleen Pasadomo said lawmakers will wait to make any abortion changes until after the Florida Supreme Court acts on a challenge to a new state law that prevents abortions after 15 weeks of pregnancy. She said she wants exceptions for rape and incest. So is it likely that Republicans will sh support a shorter window for legal abortions, maybe perhaps with these exceptions? I... I, I feel pretty confident that we're going to see a much more extreme ban in Florida. Um, you know, the Senate president has a mixed history on abortion issues in Florida. She was actually once much more moderate. But as we saw during the previous legislative session, despite her initial opposition to an abortion ban without exceptions, she supported an abortion ban without exception. So candidly, I, I don't really feel confident that the Florida Senate is going to hold the line on abortion issues. And uh, a 12 week abortion ban is still an abortion ban. And whether it happens now or next session, uh, the Florida legislature will pursue an all out abortion ban. I'm already hearing rumors that there will be a special session in January to ban abortion. And so we need every Floridian to be ready to fight back. Uh, we're actually already hosting on January 2nd, a virtual event uh, to talk about the state of abortion in Florida. Um, there'll be national rallies on January 22nd, which would have been the anniversary of Roe v. Wade. And so um, we should be preparing for a six-week abortion ban, and if not worse. Um, I, I, I don't see Governor Ron DeSantis signing uh, um, a, a, another version because he's running for president against Trump. And if you're doing that, uh, you need to appeal to your conservative base where President Trump can claim credit for the Dobbs decision. DeSantis at this point doesn't have that type of anti-abortion track record. So he needs to build it. And unfortunately that's at the cost to Floridians and our bodily autonomy and freedom um, um, via the state legislature. What can you tell people about this January 2nd event? Is it something that's online or? Yes, uh, so we're uh, hosting a virtual event. So you can find it um, on our on our website and our Facebook page, and that's facebook.com slash Anna for Florida, two ends all spelled out. Um, if you go to our events tab, we're basically hosting a, a virtual workshop to talk about the state of abortion in the country and in Florida and what you can do um, to get plugged in to take action. So that's at six o'clock Eastern time on January 2nd online. We'll also stream it on our Facebook page, but we do encourage folks to RCP and um, do expect uh, statewide rallies on January 22nd, that's Sunday. Our guest is Anna Eskamani, a state representative from the Orlando area, and you're listening to WMNF's Tuesday Cafe. Uh, Representative Eskamani, there's been well-documented problems with Florida's unemployment website where people apply for benefits. So remind people what caused that and whether there are still problems that exist with that website. 
The unemployment website and system continues to be criminally broken. Um, and there hasn't been a lot of news attention on it compared to in the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. But candidly, um, for our office here in District 42, it's deja vu. Um, we are actually receiving phone calls and emails from claimants that we helped over a year ago um, coming back to us because they have issues with their claim. Um, a, a lot of Floridians are getting notices saying that they were overpaid during the pandemic and they're being asked to appeal, uh, which is a huge burden. And also, again, ironic because over a year ago, it was announced by DO that they would not be going after these these. Uh, supposed overpayments. And I, I, I say that again with air quotes because the problem with these overpayments is that DEO basically qualified this person to receive benefits and potentially pay them incorrectly. And that's not the, the Floridian's fault, that's the agency's fault for giving them permission in the first place. And so now Floridians are being asked to pay back you know, X number of dollars that they've already spent on essential services and, and goods. Um, and so that'll, that, that is creating huge, huge tension and stress for Floridians. And then you also have folks who are impacted by hurricanes, Ian and Nicole, who are applying for disaster unemployment assistance, but being told that their claim is on hold because of an issue for the pandemic and they cannot talk to a human. There is no customer service. And while these systematic problems have persisted, I wanna be clear, that the benefits themselves are still incredibly low. You know, for those who've never tapped into unemployment in Florida, please realize that no matter how much money you make right now, you will only receive a maximum of $275 a week if you qualify for the max. And that's only available anywhere from, you know, right now 12 weeks, um, because despite the national average being 23 weeks, Florida operates on a sliding scale. And so our unemployment system is built to be cheap. And despite the fact that we gave big businesses a huge tax break a year ago with their unemployment compensation programs, Floridians have seen no benefits from that whatsoever. Moving on to uh, gun control, I suppose. Last week, Governor Ron DeSantis said he supports and he expects the state legislature will pass what some people call constitutional carry. That means people in Florida would not need a license to carry concealed weapons. How has that played out in other states? It's incredibly problematic and unsettling. Uh, you know, permitless carry essentially means that you don't have to have any type of training um, to get a uh, to, to get a firearm. There's no more concealed weapons permit required. And at the same time, um, if you tie that to open carry, then you can essentially expose your weapon wherever you are. And when it comes to situations of mass shootings. Um, or even just you know, uh, um, community-based violence, it can be very difficult for law enforcement to identify um, who the perpetrator is when guns are all readily exposed. Um, you also have situations of friendly fire, um, situations of vigilante uh, uh, defense, which um, you know, case by case, sometimes um, there, there is a positive result from that, but in most cases there's not. Um, and you have uh, children who are playing with guns that are not being locked away responsibly, hurting themselves or killing themselves and others. Um, you also have situations of um, you know, alcohol being mixed with firearms, whether it's on uh, college campuses or sporting events. And, and of course, stolen guns are continued to be um, a problem in our state with very little oversight or ability to track that. So we're moving in the opposite direction. You know, I, I think that Floridians overwhelmingly agree that there are common sense solutions to gun safety that are that are not partisan. Um, they don't take away a person's rights to own a firearm, but set protections so that uh, we can support responsible gun ownership while keeping our communities and our kids and all of our environments safe. And it, it's incredibly alarming that we're moving this opposite direction, but again, you know, Governor DeSantis um, made this commitment that he would pass permitless carry before he left the governor's office. And so unfortunately, no one should be surprised by this, but uh, we need to be ready. Uh, if you are someone who is a responsible gun owner that poses these policies, we need to hear from you because I, I do think it's going to be the voice of responsible gun owners alongside, you know, moms and parents who have kids who are worried about their child's safety. 
it's gonna be the voices of folks who are uh, most at risk and also have um, most knowledge on gun ownership. They're gonna carry the most weight when it comes to this issue. Our guest is State Representative Anna Eskamani, and I promised to let you go at 10.35. Do you have time <laughs> for like two or three more questions? Sure, go? I'll grab a few more, absolutely. All right, sounds great. Well, Clay is wants to know if this new insurance law can be challenged. Great question. Um, I would not be surprised if parts of it were litigated. You know, I'm not an attorney, so I can't speak to the, the you know, all the details on that. But I will say that Florida has a very conservative state Supreme Court now and very conservative appellate courts because DeSantis has made these appointments. So um, I have no doubt that there are folks who are much more uh, keen on what a litigation could look like that are involved in those conversations. But I also, you know, express caution because the courts are so conservative right now. All right, moving on to education. Um, how is Florida's new parental rights and education law working? Some opponents call it don't say gay. How, how is that? What does that look like on the ground in schools? Well, here's another moment of irony, because when we were fighting against this bill in the Florida legislature last session, we were told by Republicans to read the bill read the bill because the concerns that we were we were expressing they claimed were not in the bill fast forward to the bill being signed into law and now being implemented and every concern that we expressed has come to reality and now it's my turn to tell republicans to read the bill because they 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 proclaim that that uh censoring lgbtq plus individuals would not happen they proclaimed that um pride history being eliminated from high school wouldn't happen they said that safe spaces and GSAs, gay straight alliances could still operate. And yet we've seen the complete opposite. You know, we've seen school districts uh, have to uh, uh, not only erase LGBTQ plus identity, whether it's from textbooks or from classroom settings, we've seen um, rainbows uh, be, be um, uh, canceled in different classroom settings. We see educators uh, worried to have a photo of their loved one if they're a same sex couple. And we've even seen school districts not even put out proclamations to recognize Pride Month. I mean, it is it is moving us backwards in time, um, purely based upon a a, a fear and a, uh, and 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 tropes about LGBTQ plus people. And I'm very concerned about the safety of our children. Suicide rates are way too high for uh, all of our young people but they're four times higher for LGBTQ plus youth. And, you know, it, it is a small but vocal minority that is pushing this dangerous agenda. And it's not only is it just creating so much unnecessary tension within our schools and pushing kids back to the closet, but it's also not addressing the actual problems we have in education. Like we have a huge exodus of teachers right now. Teachers are severely underpaid and overworked. And, and the politicization of education is all part of a larger scheme to defund public education and to push people towards private schools that are for profit and lack all accountability. And, and so it's, it's incredibly frustrating. Um, it is still being litigated you know, in the federal court, but um, um, it just speaks to how dangerous legislating culture wars is. And this is one example of many but again, you know, we need parents to, to, to speak up because uh, it is a vocal minority that's setting the tone here. And I know that, especially in, in, here in Orange County and, and in counties across the state, like we embrace diversity. We, we, we see it as a, as a strength, um, but these policies are the complete opposite. And speaking of education, Senator Joe Gruters, who is a Sarasota Republican and also the chair of the Republican Party of Florida, filed a proposal yesterday that seeks partisan school board elections. Would you be on board with that? No, I mean, again, I, I think every every one of these bills is designed uh, to uh, try to eliminate diversity within our school boards and to push forward an agenda that politicizes institutions that should be nonpartisan. Um, now, I, again, I, it's naive of me to say that school board members are not partisan. I mean, it's clear that they, they have become partisan, especially in their source of funding um, and, and the issues that, you know, school board members, especially on the right, try to define themselves by. But I, I do think that the motivation of the chairman of the Republican Party of Florida is not without bias. Like he's only following this bill because in, in areas of the state that are quote, more conservative 
NPA candidates that are much more moderate have been able to win. And that includes the Sarasota County, yeah. even in parts of Brevard County. You know, we've seen more moderate individuals run for school board and win because, again, they're appealing to the majority of the electorate. Uh, but for uh, uh, individuals who are leaders within the Republican Party, they see that as a threat to their status quo. And remember, you know, it's also about bench building. I mean, there's always criticism that the Democratic Party doesn't build a bench. And some of these local races where they can be nonpartisan, it is an opportunity for a new fresh fresh face, moderate person um, to, to build their build their trust with their constituents. And if you make these seats partisan, it just pushes people towards the extremes. And we don't need more extremes in Florida politics. We need folks that are willing to find common ground and to focus on, on, on everyday needs, not these partisan fights. Um, so his, his uh, motivation, it's, it's, it's not genuine. It's clearly partisan and we should absolutely oppose it. What else do you anticipate coming up during the 2023 legislative session? Well, um, I think you're going to see universal vouchers. Um, we're going to, you're going to see a complete push to um, I, uh, put public education at, at risk by uh, creating vouchers for everyone, um, allowing public dollars to go towards private and schools that have no accountability metrics. Um, I think housing affordability is going to be an issue uh, top of mind for me. Um, and we have to make sure that the solutions, again, are focused on, on Floridians, not industry. In particular, I want to see strength for renters and renters' rights and make sure that we're not leaving renters behind in any housing conversation. But I, I, I do suspect that housing will be top and center of this legislative session. Um, I think you're going to see um, net metering again. So for those who don't remember, you know, Florida Power and Light um, went after uh, rooftop solar last session and the bill was so unpopular, even the governor vetoed it. But now the governor doesn't have an election. I would suspect net metering would come back and the governor might sign it into law this time. Uh, so every issue you can think of is going to be on deck. Um, uh, we also know that the speaker is going after ESGs. Um, immigration, you know, the Governor DeSantis just uh, rolled out the recommendations, I'm using air quotes, from one of his grand juries on immigration, which is they basically want to create a vigilante system to target undocumented people. Uh, we already are targeting undocumented children and trafficking asylum seekers. So you're going to see this, the governor go through more of those anti-immigrant proposals. Um, and then I think you might see some um, vaccine policy. You know, the governor announced another grand jury on COVID vaccine. So I would not be surprised to see um, anti-public health measures go through the legislature. So it's, it's going to be um, a very, very uh, difficult, you know, as a Democrat, a very difficult session, but one where we have to fight for our values and, uh, and, 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 and bring more people with us to build efficacy and to build long-term political engagement. And finally, I want to ask a question that doesn't have anything to do with Florida, but in Iran, there is a, a huge women's movement going on. You're of Iranian background. What can you tell us uh, about your thoughts on the situation in Iran? Well, I really appreciate this question because um, I, I not only am I of Iranian descent, but I have family in Iran that I'm talking to constantly. And as I focus on issues in Florida, I'm watching what's happening in Iran and I'm, I'm taking action to amplify the voices of the people of Iran. And this, this revolution was led by women and, 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 and has its foundation in the calls for Zan Zendigi Azadi, which translates to women, life, freedom. And it's so important for us to speak out in support of the people of Iran and their calls for regime change. Um, one of our most recent um, uh, uh, successful campaigns was to remove the Islamic Republic from the United Nations Women's Commission, which just took place last week. And now we're continuously uh, pushing the United Nations to uh, investigate the human rights violations in Iran. Uh, those who protested are now uh, not only being incarcerated, but set to be executed. And so it, it really is um, so important that we not forget about what's happening in Iran and amplify the voices of those calling for freedom. And I, I do urge others to join me in that and uh, to also stay tuned. You know, I do plan to file a resolution this session for Floridians to support the people of Iran 
and um, have continued to work with the White House in, in good faith uh, to make sure that there's uh, alignment on um, policies with the government of Iran and holding them accountable um, as we continue to support those who are um, in the streets risking their lives to do what's right. Well, I want to thank you very much for coming on WMNF's Tuesday Cafe, Representative Eskamani. Thanks so much for having me and happy holidays to everyone. Thanks. I appreciate you coming on. State Representative Ana Eskamani is a Democrat from the Orlando area.